Hello again, everyone. Really nice to see you. Glad you had uh, the time to stop by for a, a few minutes and let me uh, bend your ear a little bit and give you some word from the Lord. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about something the Lord's laid on my heart about the future of this country. And basically, this is the first of two parts of a uh, little commentary, if, if, if you will, on uh, the 24th chapter of Isaiah. It's, this is not the whole chapter. This, this is selected parts of it, but this winds up being over half of what's in there. And uh, it just has some pertinent information and some uh, uh, relevant uh, points of view for where we stand today with the rest of the world and in the eyes of God. Um, the title for the first half of this is, if you think this week was bad for America's and President Trump's reputation, what do you see what God has shown me about America's future? Let me just dive right straight into this, okay? Like any other person of faith, I read my Bible as often as I can. The Word says we're supposed to read it every day, but even I can't always do that. And I'm a minister. It's like we all get so caught up in all the stuff that's going on during our busy days that we sometimes find ourselves laying down to sleep nearly before we know it. This past week, a colleague, uh, a colleague of mine showed me a passage out of Isaiah chapter 24 that directly applies to modern day America and other nuclear powered, nuclear armed countries like her. The clarity and brutally frank language that's used here by Isaiah as he was prompted himself by the Holy Spirit is startling and it is an ominous vision, in my humble opinion, of what I say would be the fairly near future. We're not going to have to wait long for this series of events to happen. The debacle inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. that is ongoing, uh, and especially over the last uh, week or two, has made the USA and its president the laughing stock of the world. I, for one, am ashamed of my country at the moment. And you will ordinarily never hear me say something like that because I'm quite the patriot myself. But I can see no way to say all these things with too much emphasis, quite frankly. The, Trump's admin the Trump administration, pardon me, their administration's attempt to repeal Obamacare and replace it with what amounted to a forcible confisca confiscation of the health care coverage of 24 million Americans, combined with yet another tax break for the rich, has revealed Donald Trump for what he is. An opportunist who was in the White House for his personal enrichment first and for that of America second. If the Trump administration's failed efforts to repeal the ACA are any indication of how Washington is going to handle America's domestic affairs, what will happen when it comes to America's relations with the rest of the world? If America does not repent or turn away from, that's what that word means, turn away from its ways, I warn you that a great calamity will befall her and that without remedy of any sort. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to quote for the first six verses of Isaiah chapter 24. And I quote, See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for a priest as for people, for master as for servant, for mistress as for maid, for seller as for buyer, for borrow borrower as for lender, and for debtor as for creditor. 
the earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken his word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The, the exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, our inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. The earth as we know it, it says in the very first verse, is going to be destroyed. Uh, I don't think this means we're going to collide with another planet or a wayward moon or anything like that. And uh, incidentally, this includes all the talk about the so-called planet X or Nibiru or Nibiru, but depending on how you like to pronounce it, uh, or whatever names there are floating around out there for that matter. This planet is currently located we don't know exactly where it is, but it's somewhere between Neptune and Pluto. Okay? Now, assuming that Planet X slash Nibiru is closer to Neptune than to Pluto, juxtaposed with Neptune's orbiting the Sun every 160 years, that means if Nibiru is traveling at a similar speed to Neptune, it will take it roughly another 80 years to reach the Earth, give or take. Moreover, um, it has been proven by NASA, backed up with corroborating data from the European and the Japanese space agencies that this ninth planet in our solar system is not, I repeat for emphasis, is not on a collision course with Earth. So all you Nibiru fear mongers can put your fears to bed once and for all. Or Nibiru, sorry. Anyway, moving right along, the next quote out of that passage he will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. That would mean the surface of the earth will be pretty much decimated. I think I know what they mean by that, but I'm going to hold off on the, uh, speculating on that for just a minute here. I'm going to get to that further down in, in this little uh, presentation here, okay? He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. The word scattered inhabitants, inhabitants, pardon me, suggest that population centers, cities, will be destroyed and that casualties will be high in number. It will be the same for priest as for people, for master as for servant. And I'm quoting again here. For mistress as for maid, for seller as for buyer, for borrower, borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor, the earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord, I say the Lord has spoken his word. The same fate will befall everybody. And there will be only a lucky few who escape. Key word there is few. Okay. Moreover, the complete destruction of the cities of the earth is the only thing that will destroy economic inequality. Think about that for a minute. You can't, we can't destroy economic inequality by an armed revolt. That's clearly not going to work. Moreover, that's not the way of the Lord. Was it not Jesus who put Caiaphas' uh, servant's ear back in place at the Garden of Gethsemane as he rebuked Peter to put his sword away? 
The complete destruction of the cities is the only thing that will destroy economic inequality by destroying the economic center. The center of commerce, uh, as it were. So inequality is going to come to an end. It's going to come to a violent end, and it's going to happen soon. To put that another way, the only way to destroy inequality will be to destroy the financial centers of the world, beginning with the United States. Although I can't say exactly how or when this will happen. It definitely will. You can be sure about that. Moving further down through the passage there. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. There will be a huge global drought. Global drought. Crops will fail. People are going to starve to death, even in the Western world, where this normally never occurs. Yes, even in, even in, in the United States. People are, will be starving to death in the United States of America in the foreseeable future. I'm a little older, so I don't know if I'm going to be around long enough to see that happen or not, but something I've got a sneaky feeling that I just might. I'm not counting any of my chickens or uh, before they're hatched. Don't you do it. Don't you do that. Okay, moving right along here. The earth is defiled by its people, says the Bible, says Isaiah. What does this mean to our modern world? I mean, after all, this was written... Oh, roughly 2,700 years ago. The earth is defiled by its people. Do these words still have any meaning after all these centuries? The answer to this question is an emphatic yes. How have we managed to do this, you ask? When did I defile the earth? Well, every time we throw a piece of trash on the ground or throw a wrapper or a scrap of paper out your car or truck window while you're driving down the road. Or every time we th throw anything, anything, in a landfill, and that includes everything, pour our old engine oil down a drain somewhere, or down a sewer. I don't think I need to keep going with examples here, okay? We defile the earth. Every time we do any of the above, we defile the earth, people. There is a gigantic, here's a case in point, there's a gigantic flotilla of plastic bottles and other assorted plastic garbage, scrap items, if you will, the combined size of which is as much as the entire state of Texas. The state of Texas, mind you. Floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Even as I speak these words. You need still more proof that we collectively are in grievous sin? Okay. Here you go. The permanently damaged, yes, I said permanently damaged nuclear reactors of Fukushima, Japan. There are four of them, you know. There's not, it's not one, it's four. Chernobyl, Russia was one reactor. This is four, okay? Get the picture? These re permanently damaged nuclear reactors are leaking radioactive water into the North Pacific Ocean at, or at a rate of 400 million gallons per day. At this rate... The entire northern Pacific Ocean, from Japan on the west coast to the uh, from Japan on, uh, in the western Pacific to over to the west coast of North America and Canada, will be devoid of life in no more than ten years. And you can go ahead and throw Alaska in while you're at it. All the all the fishing up in Alaska, it's going away. All those fish are going to be dead. They were measuring radiation levels with a Geiger counter. 
on the Pacific Shore on a video I saw on YouTube the other night. Radiation levels uh, just standing next to the shore are already 10 times normal. That is to say, they are already 10 times above safe limits. Now, suppose you somehow were to make a planet and inhabit it with 7 billion people like this giving them life and the power and will to live it, and they turned around and destroyed it just because they could. <laughs> How would you react? Now you know how God feels. Moving further along, and I quote, they have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. What laws? What laws? What are they talking about? Laws? Well, we could start with the Ten Commandments. When you break one, you break them all. That's what the Bible says. Or how about the two greatest commandments, to use a different example? You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As before, if we break one, even once, we have broken them all as far as God is concerned. Therefore, the Bible says, Isaiah wrote, a curse consumes the earth. Now, does this mean God will curse the planet and everything on it? Mm, of course not. Don't be so fearful. It's not what it means. Is God going to personally intervene and cause all this to occur? No, it does not appear so as we further examine this quote from Scripture. Its people must bear their guilt. Now, you're probably thinking, guilt? Guilt for what? What am I supposed to feel guilty about? I, I, I haven't done anything wrong today. I ain't hurt nobody. I ain't took nothing that didn't belong to me. I didn't tell a lie. Well, that's fine. That's all well and good. But, you see, for all the things that I mentioned above, from ruining, ruining the Pacific Ocean to the Ten Commandments and the Two Greatest Commandments and so on, but that's not all. No, sorry, there's one more major thing that we've been guilty of and that defaces the earth, ruins God's planet that he created for us, and we turn around and we trash it. What am I talking about? Waging war. Warfare. Mm -hmm. Although people will accuse me of being unpatriotic at best, and I do not wish to be offensive to anyone. But the USA, the United States of America, is addicted to war, and it has been for at least the last 75 years. Our national economy depends on war and has ever since I've been alive, and I'm 61 years old. Moreover, we could remain the only country in the world to have used nuclear weapons at a time of war. The only one. America has let the nuclear genie out of the bottle. It cannot be put back in no matter how great or how well-intentioned the effort. America's, America has let the cat out of the proverbial bag, okay? When it comes to nuclear power and then the risks thereof. Meanwhile, we are indirectly responsible for the Fukushima disaster as well as for any future nuclear conflicts. We, the, uh, the United States of America, are indirectly responsible, even as the citizens, for the Fukushima disaster as well as for any future nuclear conflicts regardless of who started it. Granted, granted, I understand, no one could have predicted an earthquake and a tsunami of that magnitude when it happened back in 2011, but the reactors should never have been located that close to the ocean in the first place. I'm no nuclear engineer. I could, I could figure that out. 
and not in an earthquake-prone country like Japan at the very least. So in the end, the nuclear threat that we face globally is America's fault and America is going to end up paying the price. How? <laughs> What's that last sentence say? Therefore, Earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. What does that mean? Hmm, I can sum that up in two little words. Nuclear war. What else could this be describing? Just read it. Let it sink in. If you don't have a Bible, pull it up on your phone. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 6. Read it for yourself. This isn't my opinion. This is God's word. This is what the Bible says will happen to us if we don't change our ways. The heat. Let me explain something here. The heat generated by a thermonuclear explosion is ten times that of the surface of the sun. So those who are caught up in what I suspect will be the coming nuclear conflagration, again, unless America changes its ways, will be instantly vaporized. Poof, and you're gone. Not a pleasant thought, to say the least. Your only consolation is that your death will be painless. You probably won't feel a thing. Now, how do we stop this? By protesting in the streets and getting involved in our country's political process. I see no other way. Besides, in the process of protesting against war, protesting against nuclear weapons, of protesting against the pollution, not that, that's not even a strong enough word anymore, excuse me, against the ruination of the earth. That's how we do it. I see no other way. It's time to get out into the streets, put down your video games, turn off your stinking television. You don't need to be watching all that crap anyway. That stuff's not from God. And if you're watching Christian TV, i got bad news for you. A lot of the stuff that's on that ain't from God either. Although not all of it. Not all of it. But that's another topic. How do we stop this? By protesting in the streets, by getting involved in our country's political process. You go to the polls and vote when it's time to vote. I see no other way. Besides, in the process of doing all this protesting, has it, has it already occurred, not already occurred to you that we'll be siding with God and against humankind, against the military-industrial complex? I'd rather be on God's side than the side of the American empires. How about you? It suits me just fine. This is Reverend Paul J. Byron with Progressive Christian, uh, Christian Ministries of Greater Atlanta. Thanking you for your time. Visit my website at www.pcmatl.org. And don't forget to visit my book page. That's all for now. Thanks a lot. And be blessed. In Jesus' name.